Hi everyone and welcome to ABC's of Anesthesia and yeah, I've just got to really thank Tim. He's uh, offered to be interviewed live uh, for our podcast and YouTube channel. So yeah, welcome Tim and yeah, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, thanks Leo. I'm Tim. I'm a, a PGY5, so I'm an anesthetic PHO in Queensland. I actually work with Elle, who you had on uh, oh, nice. the podcast <laughs> previously, so we've been sparring for a couple of weeks for interview practice, oh, so it's been good. pretty good. Oh, that's good. And, and um, so you, you want to do anesthetics, obviously? Yeah, so I'm applying to the program in Queensland, so interviewing in a couple of days, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then outside of work, things that I enjoy, so mindfulness mm -hmm. and also uh, stoic philosophy I've really gotten into in the last, um, like, six months. So oh, yeah. A bit of William it, B. Irving, is that? Oh, well, well, I love William Irving. <laughs> um, I think it, it really helps me with, like, uh some of the practices at work hmm. for instance like things that are beyond my control the dichotomy of control which for people who are interested is things that are in your control and things that are outside of your control and at work i find that now that i've recognized that some things are totally beyond my control or influence then i'm not so bothered by them yeah, yeah. that's it. that's excellent um it's one of those yeah, stoic philosophy, I've never even heard of it. I think most people just thought about being stoic as just putting up with stuff. But it's it's, it's so interesting yeah. that suddenly uh, it's, it's back that now, you know, you can actually, you know, listen to podcasts about it and, uh, some, you know, great information by, yeah, William Irving, obviously, he's written a couple of books about real yeah. practical aspects of it. I think he's really taken off uh, in the year of COVID, which I guess <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, let, let's get started. So what, what I'll do, I'll ask you a question, sure. give you some feedback and, yeah, just take it as, as you know, just trying to improve and uh, don't worry about who cares if you do something great or if you stuff up it's all about learning so yep uh let's get started uh, what do you want to do anesthetics uh so in terms of uh, my pursuit of anesthetics as my calling uh so i'd broadly split it up into uh the career that anesthetics is and then the day-to-day -day work that anesthetics involves so i'm an anesthetics pho so i've been very fortunate to within my department get to know a lot of the consultants i feel like my personality matches really well within the department um, and i really enjoy working alongside the consultants and my registrars the consultants at work seem to have a really good work-life balance which is uh, quintessential for me in my career choice um, and there's a lot of teamwork and camaraderie that happens within theatres on a daily basis. So it's not just the anaesthetic team, but it's also the theatre team. Uh, we interact with the surgical and obstetric teams at our centre. And so that's really interesting. Um, beyond that, in terms of uh, the career as well, so there's some really interesting branches that anaesthetics is entering. So these would be specifically perioperative pain medicine. And I have an interest in both and I'd love to see where that takes me. Uh, in terms of the day-to-day -day, um, job, so I'd say, firstly, that it's challenging. Secondly, that it's uh, very interesting. And thirdly, that it's rewarding. So in terms of challenging, so there's just a very large breadth of knowledge tested by the primary exam. Um, and I think, for instance, in terms of interesting, uh, my consultant and I spent an endoscopy session would have been about three weeks ago just discussing the four ways that propofol could be lethal to a patient and so it's very interesting just to see like physiology and pharmacology in action uh within a couple of seconds or within a couple of minutes of us administering the drug drugs and then to the last point um in terms of being rewarding so this year for instance i've learned to undertake uh, epidurals independently and it is very very rewarding to uh, and gratifying to be able to help uh, like female patients through their labor journey because this is one of the more grueling trials in human nature. Hey, so that, that was actually really good. So I'll give you some overall feedback. Your, you know, your manner is fantastic. Um, it's like your Zoom's hard to engage across the stream, but because you're, you, you just seem naturally excited and very personable, so yep. I think that, that will you know, hold you in really good stead. So that, that's really great. Uh, the pace of your voice, the tone, just the general, you know, verbal and speech is is fantastic. So nothing really this sort there. Excellent. And your eye contact is to the camera, which is fantastic. A lot of little things, which uh, it takes a lot of practice for people on Zoom to, to get right. So you're doing really yep. well there. Uh, in terms of the answer, I, I like the structure. You know, you've got you know, very, very anesthetic-like structured answers, which I think will go down really well with the examiners. So I'll start with the interviewers. Uh, so that is a really good point. And the fact that you drew out some examples. Um, so 
you know, something about I really, really love the knowledge. And, you know, I spent a morning talking about the interesting aspects of profile. And you actually mentioned something that was real. So it wasn't just you telling me how much you love interaction of pharmacology and physiology, which is just a cliche to say. So yep. you, you could have even said it for the last one and, and the satisfaction of the job. You know, I've recently just been accredited for doing epidurals uh, by myself. And, you know, I remember that first time that I did it independently and the patient's pain was taken away. I, it, yep. was, it was such a thrill. You know, you can, you can invoke th that similar thing that you did in the, in the other example with this because right now you want to give them as much of a story of yourself rather than words because everyone's got words but you want a unique story so that was all really good uh the one sure. thing I, the one thing i'd say then is you and, and this is something i personally don't care that you say but you're going to be interviewed by people who are you know somewhat old school so if you lead with work-life balance that may be a risky move Okay. Uh, yes. Because you're in Queensland, it might be different to Victoria. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe we're way more <laughs> about not work life balance. I don't know. But yeah, just uh, be I thought aware. I thought you were cycling. Uh, <laughs> like you were cycling and running was on point. Yeah, but I would. I I never said any of that in my interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All I care about is anesthetics and anesthetics yeah. is life and study yeah. is my world. <laughs> that's that's what I said. Yeah. But. I think we're all, all very similar that we do like work work life balance, but yeah, yep. I wouldn't necessarily lead with that. But that's just my opinion. Um, for the for the interview, I like that. You, you know, I, I don't care that someone says that because I think that's realistic and healthy. Uh, yep. Good. So, do you, uh, Lahira, do you mind if I just share a brief anecdote? Yeah, please. Uh, so, something that's really helped me is uh, in your videos with Kaz, you guys mm. really emphasize structure and framework in yeah. all your answers, and so yeah. Elle and I started to practice with that. And one of the other registrars, like she hadn't done as much practice as so she was kind of exasperated. Like, how can we need to co cover all this content? And I said, mm. well, no, like a lot of the stuff is relevant day to day practice, but also mm. like it's a fun, it's like an extension of preparing for the next steps in anesthesia, which is, as you said, like the vivas, mm. being able to answer them correctly. And then also a lot of the questions overlap with the consultant jobs. And that's a long way off for me personally, but yeah it doesn't harm to like have a good structure and interview manner, I guess, long term. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, look, I'm, I'm glad that you like that. And I've, yeah. I've got no proof of the fact that this would work. It's just my opinion. I think that the anesthetics in the medical community rewards frameworks and they, they like that organization, but yep. you know, I, I just suspect uh, all, all I say is, you know, don't believe me, try it out in your practice, <laughs> see if it works, see if it's looked on favorably. And if it does, you know, great. But I know that on the interview panel, there might be, you know, three to seven people and each of them might perceive things differently. So, you know, I've just got no guarantees on it, but I, I just suspect that that's the best way of doing it. Um, sure. How about, how about this? Let's uh, go with you're in theater. Let's say you were the consultant and you're doing a 60 year old, uh, patient otherwise well but having an anterior resection uh, during the case you notice that the blood pressure falls to 60 uh, yep. but the consultant really hasn't done anything about it what, what do you do um, so I think ultimately I need to uh, have my patient safety as my f first and foremost priority so I think realistically because uh, this can quickly deteriorate it'd be really important to have the consultant on board and generally the anesthetic consultant is the team leader in a situation like this where there's a hypotensive crisis in the theater so generally if it was a less urgent situation i would use the earlier steps of greater assertiveness so like a probe or alert but in this case it wouldn't be so much a challenge so much as just like telling them that the situation is pretty critical um, so i declare the situation uh, to my consultant and ask if they wanted to hit the red buzzer or the blue buzzer, depending on whether we're in hours or out of hours uh, within theatre. Um, and I definitely uh, consider like giving some presses and fluids. So like let's, depending on what the heart rate. Let's say that the, the consultant just is having a chat with the registrar or so with the surgical registrar operating and just brushes you off and says, yeah, no, 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 everything's fine. Yep. What do you do then? So again, so I'd use the steps of greater disturbedness, but what I think- are, What are those steps, by the way? Uh, so I use um, a four part, like the most common four part step, which would be our probe, alert, challenge, and emergency or escalate. I think in this situation, um, I'd, again, so something, for example, a probe would be, are you aware that this patient's blood pressure is 60? Mm -hmm. And then an alert would be, 
this patient's blood pressure is quite low, it's 60. And then a challenge would be, I think we should really address this um, and call for more help or like institute an immediate management plan. And then emergency would be, it's not so much that they're doing anything, it's their, it's their inaction that's quite bad in this situation. So I, I'd probably just inform them that I'm calling for additional help, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that, I acknowledge that that's pretty hard to do, isn't it? So would you tell yes. the consultant that you're calling for additional help? I think I'd have to be upfront because um, even though there's a bit of a power imbalance and mm -hmm. this consultant's thinking one way, I think ultimately I have, I have to have the patient safety mm -hmm. um, as the that, foremost priority. That's good. So what I'd say, Jess, is uh, I like that you highlighted the things that you would say for each step. With the yep. A step, it's alert or assess. So I, I would, okay. this is one thing where I'd sh try to sh share my frame. So, uh, you know, I don't know what the consultant's frame is and they don't know my frame of reference. So I'd say, hey, look, I'm so sorry to bother you. The blood pressure is 60. I'm really worried this patient is gonna uh, have poor perfusion of their organs, might have an ischemic event. That's why yep. I'm really worried about this. And you, you know, they need now to, they, they know my frame, so they're not gonna think anything differently for example this could easily happen in a trauma situation you know yep. with blood loss and you, the consultant may be doing hypertensive resuscitation and i remember this happened to me and i didn't know that that's what they were doing and i was i was really worried for the patient's safety until finally it came to like oh that's i was a, re a resident i didn't know that this was a thing i just thought the yep. blood pressure was 70 and the patient was going to die and i was really worried um <laughs> yep. so sharing your frame in uh, the uh, assess or alert step would be very useful Let's, let's keep get going and making this a bit harder. Let's say uh, after this initial blood pressure is treated, uh, the, you notice that the consultant is just not paying too much attention and the blood pressure keeps falling down and they're not really doing anything about it. So the, the, the consultant seems very happy to run this patient at a systolic of 70 and is, is just not really paying too much attention to the anesthetic. What are you doing? Uh, so I think Probably in the scenario that you uh, that's been painted, there are two main issues. Uh, the first and the most, most pertinent would be patient safety. If there's prolonged hypotension, then that could mean an organ damage and potentially uh, precipitate in the rest. And secondly, um, more longitudinally looking would be uh, the consultant not paying as much attention. Um, so this would need to be investigated further. And I could speak to that after the initial management. Would you like me to go through the initial management? Uh, actually, yeah, go for it. Uh, so in terms of my initial management, um, even though the blood pressure has initially been corrected, I uh, definitely want to like discuss with my consultant what their thinking would be around this particular situation where they have a target map or systolic blood pressure and what type of um, safe it was they're running them quite low, say like at a systolic of 70, uh, what the reasons for that might be. And I might split my Let's say differentials for shock. As you're talking to them, you notice that they've got alcohol on their breath. What do you okay. do then? So this is a scenario of intoxication and it's uh, like it's direct evidence. So I, th I think in this situation, um, it like I would stay by their side because they're intoxicated, but I think they need to be relieved of all clinical duties immediately. So the two main issues would again be patient safety. And now instead of maybe inappropriate conduct, it's just misconduct from the, from the anesthetic consultant. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this patient safety, I think it's really important that the consultant is removed from all clinical duties. So the way to do this is to call the GG niece just in and ask and explain the situation to them and ask for them to be relieved. And I'd make sure that the consultant didn't have anyone uh, leave their side. I know alcohol abuse, less so than substance abuse, has a high risk of suicide. Um, and they, they also need a way, for instance, to, to get home safely. Excellent, that's fantastic. So uh, I like your steps. As I kind of made this situation harder and harder, it's great that you, you really rolled from one framework to the next. Uh, yep. And in this one, I like that it was patient safety and staff safety. Um, and that was all, that was, sorry, patient safety, staff safety, and that was all completely fine. Good, good. Let's, let's move on with the next kind of question. Um, tell me about a time in clinical practice you were criticized or you felt like you performed poorly. Uh, sure. So I could definitely speak to um, a recent list I was doing in ophthalmology uh, with uh, one of my consultants, and we did a bunch of sub tenons blocks. I wouldn't say this was a hugely Poor performance. It was just a. Um, it was just not our optimal performance, I would say. And the reason being that 
is that after four subtenons blocks went in and the ophthalmology list was finished, the ophthalmology consultant came up to me and talked to me about how some of the subtenons blocks didn't really work as well as he would have liked and they were a bit too, uh, they were a bit too medial and too close to the medial rectus, um, causing a bit of bleeding. And so I, I took this as an opportunity to really uh, ask him about how he approaches his sub blocks. He told me he goes at more like a um, four o'clock and seven o'clock angle. Um, and so he's a bit more inferior. And the planes that he would use and kind of the feels that we, he would have I also took the opportunity to probe in terms of uh, our blocks being a bit subpar how this impacts his surgery mm -hmm. and what whether he has to change his techniques or anything like that so this was really useful information to me personally um, and I went back to my consultant and fed that back to her so it was good that we both had a learning opportunity and I also took it as an opportunity to uh, look more into like sub the sub tenons blocks um, specifically so at my hospital we only do sub tenons blocks and peribulbar blocks and so I know that the ABCs of anesthesia, for instance, have a specific video regarding tips and tricks for something that's watched, which I watched. Thanks for plugging my videos. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was, that's what I watched. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was a really good answer. There's, you had so many learning points from it, which is, I think that that was really good to have that you were, you, you know, you were saying, yeah, it was, it was too much this way. I spoke to the surgeon, looked at their practice, looked at how I can improve my practice got feedback on this you know you can if you can make so many improvements from one incident i feel like that's great so yep. the fact that you didn't have just one thing but you had a few things i i was really i was really liking that um cool. this is not bad um so in oh, the first hero yeah just, sorry just a point i got from my friend who sat the interviews uh last year hmm. he explained to me that at the end of the day they're not really interviewers wherever they are they're not really too worried about the uh, incident as long as it's not critical or you didn't really mess up but yes. they're really interested in like how you learn from it and like wh whether it changed your practice and I thought that was a really interesting because mm -hmm. I think when I was thinking of these examples last year I would often spend a lot of time on developing the scenario or the error mm -hmm. or the feedback itself but it was mm -hmm. more just how I reacted to it yeah that was a really yeah. interesting insight yeah that's a good point yeah you, you definitely want to have a few incidents that are you know learned that you learn from, but nothing that shows that you were negligent, obviously, uh, that, that's terrible. And hopefully no one has done yep. anything negligent. Um, no, but that, that's a really good point. Um, let's move on to a clinical question. Uh, let's say, uh, how much anesthesia have you done? Uh, so this would be my seventh month. Seventh month, okay, cool. Uh, you've had a patient with a tonsillectomy. So let's say a 25 year old tonsillectomy patient, otherwise well, uh, your consultant, and yourself start with the next tonsillectomy case, but then you're called to recovery because the nurse is very worried because the patient's SATs are decreasing. What do you do? Uh, so I think this scenario is concerning for a patient who might acutely deteriorate. I think if the nurse is concerned, then I'm concerned. Um, so my immediate steps would be to immediately attend this patient. Um, if they met any of the call criteria, then I'd uh, hit the buzzer within the uh, PACU environment mm -hmm. um, and then I promptly assess the patient so a quick uh, doctor's A to E assessment and I can talk to the intricacies yeah. of that if yeah, you like. sure so my first step is to assess for danger so whether there's anything contributing to the lowered stats like um, and clear that out of the way then mm -hmm. responsiveness so I use cows which is can you hear me open your eyes what's What's your name and squeeze my hands then yep. send let's for say, help let's say you get no there's... response for that and you send for help uh, but let's say it's it's a small hospital and you're literally you're by yourself with your consultant in the theater well into another case okay so i think if we're well into another case um the other patient who's currently on the table can't be left unattended mm -hmm. so it'd really be a case of division of uh, labor so either myself or the consultant would have to go. I think if okay. it was a bit of a concerning case, then it's probably preferable if my consultant goes. Fantastic. And I, I, could I, really, I really wanted you to say that, but let's say for this exercise, the consultant has enough trickiness to sort out with that case. So you're it. What do you do? <laughs> uh, so in terms of the airway, I need to uh, clear any potential obstruction. Um, if they were actively aspirating, for instance, or uh, coughing up a lot of blood, then I might roll them onto the 
side laterally. Just try and clear it out of the way. Consider suction. Uh, in terms of breathing, so look, listen, feel for breathing. If there is breathing, then I need to have uh, know what the sats are, the respiratory rate, the work of breathing, and mm -hmm. maybe auscultate. Mm -hmm. And then if there is uh, adequate breathing, then I'd move on to circulation. So hemodynamics, whether or not they're mentating well, which would be kind of moving on to D a bit. So disability. You've, um, you've moved through that structure well. Let's say the patient's sats are 90%. Uh, the patient is breathing, yep. uh, but you notice that there's a lot of seesaw breathing. Uh, on inspection, you hear a lot of gurgling sounds. There's a lot of blood in the airway as well. Uh, hemodynamics are fine. Uh, everything's normal. Uh, patient's heart rate is 90, uh, blood pressure 120. Uh, what do you do? So if the hemodynamics are fine, but they have a lot of seesawing, it could be potentially a sign of an upper airway obstruction. Mm -hmm. So I think I'd want to look inside their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the next steps, I'd probably just call my consultant and say, hey, here's my uh, assessment. I haven't done too much ENT. Um, like, what would what should the next steps be? I'm not sure. No, and that's and that's perfectly fine. So this this can be this can become a really super advanced kind of case that even a consultant would be, depending on how bad it is, can be very stressed out by this case. Uh, yep. So that's good that you're now reflecting. So you had a good strategy. Um, you know, call for help. Your doctor's ABC was. You know, you went through it quickly and succinctly and precisely. So that was great as well. What is your framework for obstruction uh, of an airway? Do you have, do you have a framework for how you the, solve the diagnostics of an obstruction? Um, well, for for obstruction. obstruction, I would split it into partial versus complete. So if yep. I can hear stridor or breath sounds, then I'm mm -hmm. uh, less concerned that it would be complete. Mm -hmm. um, and then within like both partial and complete, then I could split it up into the etiology. So mm -hmm. whether it's like a physical obstruction or airway swelling, mm -hmm. um, foreign body yeah yeah sounds good i've got a structure of intraluminal luminal sorry so intraluminal wall or external and that's just yep. that's just the one structure i have I, it didn't matter that you didn't say that because I, I like that you had some structure you know this is this is for yep. uh, you know for, for your for your job that's not a yeah i'm not i'm not drilling you or questioning you like you're in the viva i just need to know you've got some structure yep. <laughs> that's, that's yep. really good um Hey, so Tim, everything, uh, everything looks really good with that. Um, is there any particular question you want me to ask you just for practice or feedback before we, before we end up? Um, yeah, so I was pretty interested in what you thought of. I'm still not, I'm still meandering about with the, like the weaknesses question. Oh yeah, go for it. Um, let, let listing let, multiple weaknesses. Let me ask you that. Uh, yeah, during, during your clinical career, has, there, has anything come to light that you're mindful of that you need to work on something that's you know you're not performing well at sure so i could definitely uh, talk about um earlier this year as an anesthetics pho um i received feedback from a couple of my consultants that i was uh, perhaps not as open with my communication with the team as i should have been so i came from the intensive care last year where i used a lot of close communication in high fidelity situations and uh, in the theatre environment, the communication between staff is a little bit different where there's uh, more open discussion and it's sometimes a bit less time sensitive than say in the met calls. So um, my consultants told me it'd be good if I had more of the team on board. So I took this on board as well as I could and I really tried to make it a point to uh, during every case, talk through the case and my clinical reasoning with the anaesthetic nurses and also the surgical registrars and the theatre team. Um, and I also always ask for feedback after my list morning and afternoon with my anaesthetic nurses. So I think I've made some improvements, but definitely still um, a bit to go. Yeah, that's good. I, I think that's a genuine, you know, thing that anyone can work on. So in terms of a weakness or a performance thing that you're aware of, I, I think that that's a very good answer. Um, I, I wasn't sure what you were going to say at the start. So if there's anything I could say for feedback, um, say uh, to be clear about what the actual problem was, yeah. might, might be something. So uh, the feedback that I got at the start of the year was uh, my communication with the rest of the team wasn't as rigorous as it was with the consultant. Uh, and this is probably because of, in, the, in, the, in the ICU environment, you know, maybe things were more time sensitive or I had familiarity with my team there and I was just unfamiliar with the people. And so what I did yeah. was just ask, to you know, talk about the plan at the time out with the nurse and the surgeon, and at the end of every day, get feedback from them saying, "Hey, how did I do? Is there any way I can improve?" I found this was really great. They were really happy with 
uh, yep. the fact that I was humbling myself and wanting their you know, ex expertise to try and improve myself. So I think I think yep. I would say it's something like that. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. No, that was really good. I, Tim, I, I, you know, your manner, everything you're coming up with right now, the way you're answering these questions on the fly, I think it's, it's, it's really good. So yeah, I think you're doing really well. <laughs> Excellent, Lahiru. Oh, can I just, uh, in the in honor of yourself and Kaz's structures, oh, yeah? I just had a pers personal recommendation to you, anyone like who l watches or listens, oh, yeah. and also to yourself. Oh, yeah. So firstly, just to the audience, things that really helped me is, um, I think you guys have kind of alluded to, to it, but specifically, Anska have like well-being mm -hmm. special interest group documents. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they also have like professional statements and these are really helpful for scenarios and what to do in them because they're the actual ecologist position on them. Oh, excellent. So yeah. that's they're really, actually, so I'll, I'll try to put a link down. That's really great to remind us actually, because it's like all the answers to all the interview questions are in those documents, or at least the, um, yep. the essence of the structure. So yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> Just on the, on the global pitch, I know you're, uh, for your ABCs of anesthesia bootcamp, mm. you, I think asked for a donation to Fred Hollows, but one thing that I can mm. highly recommend is, um, I don't know about how Fred Hollows ranks in the give well and effective altruist uh, like communities, but mm. effective altruism is kind of like evidence-based medicine, but evidence-based charity. And mm -hmm. GiveWell's kind of like the premier site for ranking how cost-effective charities are. So that's something that Sam Harris, the Sam Harris podcast got me into. I know you and Kaz uh, yeah. talked about that. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's it's like, it's pretty cool just because we always talk about like evidence-based practice or yes. whatnot, but with awesome. charities too, they exist. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking that myself. The reason I went with Fred Harlow's business, everyone can, like, it's very reputable. Everyone knows about it, whereas GiveWell, not everyone knows yep. about it yet. So I had to yes. essentially get people on board with something that, you know, you, yep. you, they know, but also they can go, oh, $25, you know, that's eyesight, that's one lens, and people yep. can really yeah, for sure. that. Sounds like, sounds like we got a lot to talk about, Tim. So we, we could do a whole other podcast sure. on, on this stuff. So no, let's, let, let's, let's organize and let's do it sometime. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks a lot for having me. No, no worries at all. Um, I might close off then. Um, so, yeah, thanks everyone for watching sure. and listening. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim, for volunteering your time and yeah, being under the pump today. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah we'll, catch, we'll catch everyone again next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.